Hello everyone and welcome to Export Development Canada's webinar about financing solutions for your working capital and foreign investment. I'm Dominique Bergevin, Senior Underwriter here at EDC and the moderator for today's session. Before we begin, please note that we are also webcasting today's session using simultaneous French interpretation. So if you would prefer to listen en français, simply click on the français button that's on your screen. Alors, pour notre auditoire francophone, nous offrons une interprétation simultanément. Veuillez tout simplement choisir le bouton français sur votre écran. For those of you who are not as familiar with Export Development Canada or EDC, I'd just like to mention that EDC is Canada's official export credit agency. Think of us as a bank and an insurance company all rolled up into one, which is completely dedicated to helping Canadian companies grow their business in international markets. EDC helps Canadian companies of all sizes, from all sectors, to respond to international business opportunities. And this includes sharing our wealth of knowledge and expertise on various markets, which we've gained by working with more than 7,000 Canadian companies and dealing in more than 200 markets worldwide. The purpose of today's webinar is to share some insight about the various financing solutions that EDC can offer to meet the needs of your company, your foreign subsidiary, or your foreign customer. You'll also hear from a company who's had challenges acquiring the financing required to grow their business and how they overcame those challenges. If you're a Canadian company that's looking to graduate to the next level but need help with financing to get there, you've come to the right place. Joining me here in Ottawa today is my colleague Elaine Sicoli, EDC's Program Manager for the Export Guarantee Program from our international financing team. Hi, Elaine. Hello, Dominic. Joining us from our studio in Mississauga, we have our EDC colleague, Jeff Keats, who is our manager for international financing. Hi, Jeff. Hi, Dominique. And we're very fortunate to have two representatives joining us from Scott Barrett Foods, a true Canadian success story that has enjoyed phenomenal growth and success over just a few short years. Here to tell us just how they did this is the president of Scott Barrett Foods, Dan Scott. Hi, Dan. Well, Dominic, happy to be here. Great. We're happy to have you here. As well, we have the VP of Sales and Marketing for Scott Barrett, Mike Durham. Hi, Mike. Hi, Dominic. Thanks for the invitation. Well, welcome to all four of you to our uh, webcast. And of course, I'd also like to welcome all of our participants to today's webinar, you, that are listening. We're glad to have you on board and we hope you will gain insight from today's panel discussion that you can apply to your own business expansion and growth. Following the panel discussion, we'll provide an opportunity for audience members to ask their own questions. I'll be getting them here directly and we can ask them and live get your answers. That will help you to expand your business or open a foreign subsidiary with financing. You'll also be able to access an archived version of this webinar. So if you miss an opportunity or you miss something and you want to go back to it, don't worry, we have you covered. So let's get started. Dan, the story, let's start with you. The story of Scott Barrett Foods is truly inspiring. Can you tell us a bit about your company and how you've grown during the last few years? Um, during the last few years, uh, the, the company was originally started in 1985. Uh, we started in jams and pie fillings, uh, um, servicing the food service industry and restaurants, penitentiaries and nursing homes. Uh, we started with four people in a 5,000 square foot facility in Mississauga. First year sales around $200,000. Um, we grew from jams. We started making custom um, fillings for uh, institutional bakers when, when the uh, when, uh, bake off uh, uh, pastries became uh, popular. Um, we grew through the 90s. We went into caramel manufacturing, started doing caramel layering for 
nutritional bar markets. Um, from there, we we started uh, putting fillings in flexible pouching for uh, key brand owners uh, in North America to be part of their pastry kits or meal kits, uh, putting marinades into pouches for meal kits as well. So between 1985 and 2009, we grew from uh, four people uh, and uh, 200,000 to 2009 where we had about 60 people um, and we're selling around 20 million dollars in gross revenue. In, uh, in 2009 we saw an opportunity to expand our business into uh, a new packaging format that had been popular in Europe for many years but no one had um, no one has been able to bring it to North America successfully um, and we, we felt that uh, we had the knowledge and customer base uh, to pursue this new flexible uh, package uh, for sometimes a picture tells a thousand words this is a flexible spouted pouch this is what we in 2009 installed uh, two pieces of equipment that we purchased from Italy um, uh, and started manufacturing um, fruit purees for a large national brand owner in that uh, spouted pouch and also um, started manufacturing organic baby food. From uh, 2009 uh, to 2013 uh, we expanded from uh, 60 people to 600 people uh, we opened um, a second facility uh, in uh, Indiana, uh, USA, and um, and uh, our sales and revenue grew from 20 million to 120 million uh, in the last uh, four years. Uh, so that's sort of. Well, that's a, a great story. I mean, looking at those pouches, they definitely look familiar. I see them in the grocery stores. I purchased them myself. And it really is a good e explanation. As we've seen them grow in the grocery stores, your company has, has grown as well. So the numbers that you share there from 2009 to 2013 really underscore the astronomical growth that your company has, uh, has gone through. Uh, can you talk a bit about the challenges you've experienced in being a relatively small company facing such rapid growth? Financing is always the, the, the biggest challenge. We, we experienced uh, all the typical things that you would imagine uh, growth of that nature would, would bring upon us. Um, integrating people, uh, finding people that had experienced uh, that type of growth before, uh, seen the movie, um, bringing them on board to assist in this rapid growth, um, managing uh, our physical environment, we, we had to expand from one small building of 25,000 square feet. We had to add uh, a new building every time our uh, growth constituted. So we were up to, in Canada, we were up to seven buildings all within uh, a small geographical area in order to uh, meet the demand. The demand uh, for the pouch took off. Uh, so quickly that um, we had, and it's a, it's a dream come true for many businesses to have your customers beating a path to your door because you've produced a better mousetrap. Um, we, we were in that situation. One of the biggest challenges for us was uh, allocating our capacities to as many of our customers as possible as we were ramping up our capacities to be able to satisfy their needs. So balancing allocation uh, among customers without upsetting any and, and, and trying to maintain those base. And of course the, the, one of the biggest challenges is financing that kind of growth because um, you go from two of these <coughs> machines to 16 and and you need to continue to purchase those and 
and uh, you are using your funds for operating and supporting your growth. Um, so getting uh, capital injection into the organization to to uh, support that growth uh, was probably one of our biggest challenges. I'm sure many other companies can relate with uh, some of, a lot of the challenges that you mentioned, and um, particularly on the financing front. Uh, our recent studies at EDC show that Canadian companies see financing for operating costs and foreign investments as a key barrier to growth. Can you describe the challenge um, a bit more and expand a bit on, on that challenge and how uh, getting financing in the time of growth and what that, fi uh, that challenge looked like for you? What it looked like for me was uh, after being in business for 25 years, uh, having an opportunity like this come along uh, doesn't happen all the time, um, and being uh, convinced and having the conviction to take my personal assets and put them on the table and, and go to our uh, bank to ask for financial support in, our, in growing our business. Um, I did that. Um, the other challenge is, is the bank itself um, being uh, a little careful and, and uh, not wanting to take all the risk on themselves. So uh, when, we, when, we were, when we were just expanding in Canada in the first two years, uh, the bank supported us because uh, we had a, a long relationship with them. We delivered our numbers and forecasts over the years uh, to their satisfaction. And they supported our growth in Canada uh, in the first couple of years. Then when we decided that uh, we had to uh, open a facility in the U.S. in order to impact and support the growth opportunities that we had, um, you know, it was, it was uh, the suggestion of our bank to to uh, bring in another lending partner to assist in, in our international requirements for, for equipping our U.S. facility. And that's when our bank suggested that we, uh, we bring EDC into the, into the mix and assist in the financing of our U.S. facility. Uh, EDC was, was uh, they came on board, um, they they supported our uh, equipment uh, purchases, and um, they also did um, uh, lending guarantees uh, to assist uh, our bank in supporting our operating line. So uh, without uh, EDC coming to the table during our expansion into the U.S., it would have been uh, very difficult for us to, to uh, continue our, our growth curve at the time. Very interesting. And before digging a bit deeper into the EDC story, maybe let's just turn to Mike, um, VP of Sales and Marketing of Scott Barrett. You ensure, I imagine, uh, that uh, you're aligning the customer requirements to your, the company's innovation efforts while ensuring a greater speed to get those innovations to the market. Can you tell us a bit about yourself and your background and how you came to join Scott Barrett? Uh, I was one of the lucky ones. I've had the opportunity to work with <clears throat> three uh, market leaders in, in the food industry. Back in the early 90s, I had the opportunity to work with Canada Bread, who was at the time privately held from a, a, a Dota Light as the company. And from there, I was fortunate to uh, land a role and, and, and learn quite a bit through the Quaker Oats Company of Canada, working both in food service and retail for about a seven-year period. And then after that, I, uh, I moved on over to the Pillsbury Company, who uh, became General Mills, again, working in both retail, food service, and a little bit of institutional as well. So I had a, a, a great learning throughout all three of those organizations. In 2004, I was being asked to move to the U.S., and for me at the time, family uh, was preferring to stay here in Canada. And coincidentally, Dan was looking for uh, somebody to head up his sales group, because uh, he saw some growth coming within his organization. And culturally, it was a perfect fit the first time we met. It, uh, his ideals met exactly with my own and was going to give me the opportunity uh, to take on a more of a leadership role in an entrepreneurial company. So uh, I jumped at it. 
And even though you decided not to move to the U.S., I, am, I imagine that you were a big part in the decision making that uh, happened to, op to set up a facility for Scott Barrett in the U.S. How did you know the company was ready to grow with a foreign subsidiary? Yeah, it was, it was interesting. Back in 2008, we, we could see some growth coming and, um, and uh, it was going to be an, another category. And as Dan was looking for some property just north of where we are now in the Caledon area, um, uh, we started gaining some traction in the spouted pouch that Dan referred to earlier. And because of the types of companies that we deal with, we deal with several large multinationals that are brand leaders and category leaders in their, in their uh, field of use. Uh, we had the knowledge knowing that the importance of having multiple sites and facilities is a prerequisite for large brands to be able to uh, maintain or contract manufacturers to be able to maintain their business with these large multinationals. Um, so that was one of the kickstarts that we started thinking, boy, maybe we need a secondary site instead of building a, a larger facility here in Canada. And with that, we also, uh, with our success, we caught the eye of of our competitors and our competitors saw what we were doing and and uh, wanted to follow suit so we were catching wind that they too were going to be opening up uh, uh, to take on some of the growth that we were experiencing and they were going to be US based which would at the time given them some competitive insulation and advantage to us for material sourcing and logistics uh, and also uh, in 2011 more specifically uh, you could really start to see the uh, the uh, Buy American mantra in the U.S. gaining steam. So it was, uh, even though we didn't know that mantra was coming, it was it was definitely in the back of our mind, uh, based on the feedback from our customers that having a U.S. facility mattered. And then the other component is the uh, Canadian border is is perceived to be a barrier for business for U.S. based organizations, even though it's somewhat seamless and typically. It's very rare for issues to happen. U.S. companies do feel that the FDA at the border can make loads go missing for a long period of time, which can potentially raise issues for those that are well equipped to manage that. And lastly, uh, Dan has some great ties to where we ultimately ended up into in the Indiana area. And the, the cost of building down there and the, the pool of uh, labor that was available to us and uh, everything else that goes along with making that decision it all tied in perfectly to being able to get the right location uh, to be within a day's drive of 65 percent of the American population uh, giving us the multiple facilities it was just the right thing to do at the right time. Very interesting it seems like there was a lot of factors that uh, weighed into this uh, strategic decision and how about you Dan um, let's talk about when you were ready to expand to the US as we know getting financing for foreign investments can be difficult as banks don't accept foreign assets as collateral how did you overcome that challenge? Well, that was that was uh, at the suggestion of our bank uh, to to bring in EDC because EDC uh, is that is their uh, mandate to support Canadian manufacturers like ourselves uh, uh, with their export plans, um, and uh, EDC uh, did just that. They came to the table with uh, a very large amount of. Of funds to for us to purchase our equipment in the U.S. and also guarantee our operating line. So that's how we kind of um, manage that piece. And how did it affect your working capital, being able to bring EDC into the picture? Well, bringing EDC into the picture enabled us to to use the the profits and the personal equity that we were putting into our business for uh, our operating needs rather than uh, our capital needs. So uh, the introduction of EDC um, uh, assisted by, by putting equipment into our business that we didn't have to finance uh, personally and we could use, we could use our, our capital for, for our growth strategies. Elaine, it's nice to see that uh, EDC was able to help Scott Barrett in its, uh, its growth and, and financing needs. Uh, can you maybe expand a bit more on the product, one of the products that Scott Barrett did use, the Export, um, export, credit, export Guarantee Program, sorry, the EGP. You are an expert in this field, so maybe you could just give us a high level of what this product is all about. Absolutely, be happy to. So the Export Guarantee Program is a guarantee that EDC provides to your bank in Canada on financing put in place for Canadian exporters um, to get the cash that you need to grow your international business. 
Uh, we typically guarantee 75% of the loan, but can go up to 100% under certain circumstances. And as you've just heard from Dan and Mike, providing a guarantee to Scott Barrett's bank, guaranteeing a percentage of their operating line of credit, got their bank comfortable providing them access to the financing that they needed to grow their business. So where does EDC provide most value? Uh, in cases where a company is new to a bank, setting up an operating line or getting a term loan for equipment can at times be a challenge as the bank has no history with your company. With EDC partnering with your financial institution, it often gets them there. As well, your financing need may relate to something your bank typically does not finance, such as purchase order uh, financing or contract financing. And again, with a guarantee from us, it can give the bank comfort in providing you with the financing you need. As in the case of Scott Barrett, um, you may be with, be with your bank for 10 or 15 years and you're in a uh, rapid growth mode and uh, you require additional cash to take on new export contracts or expand internationally. And banks typically have a ceiling for their lending exposure per, per customer. And so with us there, uh, working with the bank, banks will often uh, get comfortable and be able to sort of um, go above that ceiling, if you will, because we're taking on a lot of that risk. Excellent. So now we've talked about the Export Guarantee Program, that how it helped Scott Barrett. Um, what other financing needs could the EGP help uh, or be used for? Um, what companies could also benefit from this program? What other types okay. of uses? So the Export Guarantee can cover many different financing needs. Uh, over and above guaranteeing your operating line of credit, we can support financing related to POs or contracts, as I mentioned, equipment term loans. Um, your inventory located offshore, so typically a bank will margin inventory that's located in Canada and you get access to funding based on that margining value, but if that inventory is located offshore in a bonded warehouse or in your foreign affiliate shop, uh, they typically won't give you margining against that. Um, also providing working capital for your foreign sub or even loans related to your R&D uh, expenses. Um, as well, any size of company can bear benefit from this guarantee, small, medium or large, as long as your house bank is willing to participate with us. And just to give you a sense of size, uh, we've provided guarantees from anywhere from 18,000 to 10 million. And if you're not sure uh, whether you would fit for this type of support, don't hesitate to call us. We'll help you figure that out. So how would a company go about uh, in terms of next steps, in terms of um, seeing whether the EGP solution could be of use for them? Well, um, as you all may be aware, EDC has offices located across Canada and they're all listed on our website on www.edc.ca. Uh, so we encourage you to contact the office located closest to you. Uh, an EDC account manager will be more than happy to answer any questions you have on the Export Guarantee Program or any questions your banker has. And they can walk your banker through the process of applying for this guarantee. The bank completes a very straightforward application form and sends us some information, including a copy of the loan agreement. And then we take it from there. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. And Jeff, over to you. EDC's direct lending program was used to help Scott Barrett get the investment financing they needed for their U.S. plant. Can you tell us how that works? Yeah, sure, Dominique. So whenever we have a company that needs financing solutions, financing support, we look at the different ways to help them. It could be indirect through the export guarantee program that Elaine just spoke about where we partner with the bank, or it could be a direct solution where EDC actually is the lender and a company like Scott Barrett is our direct customer, the direct borrower. So in this case, Scott Barrett was looking for someone to finance the U.S. equipment, the U.S. machinery that's going into their plant, uh, and it turned out that direct lending from EDC was the optimal solution after discussing this over with Scott Barrett and their bank. So what EDC did is we provided a five-year term loan uh, to acquire that equipment, that machinery. Uh, we didn't finance 100% of the equipment costs. I mean, Scott Barrett had to put in some equity, uh, but we financed a, a large proportion of that acquisition cost for a five-year term loan and we structured in a manner that we were secured by the U.S. asset, so that was our collateral. As well, we had a second position security interest behind the Canadian bank and the Canadian assets, and a corporate guarantee from Scott Barrett. 
Um, things are going well. So a few years later, uh, as Scott Bear continued to grow, they needed more lending support to buy more assets. So again, we provided another term loan to Scott Barrett uh, to assist that further growth in the U.S. and it was structured the exact same way as the first deal. Are there any other ways the direct lending program can be used? Like what kind of companies or situations would benefit from this program? That's a great question, Dominique. And before I get into that, I just want to reiterate two things. First, today we're mostly talking about lending solutions, whether it's direct or the export guarantee program. That being said, there are a lot of tools in the ADC toolbox, a lot of solutions we can provide to Canadian exporting companies uh, besides just lending support. There's risk mitigation and others, and I won't get into too much detail on that today, uh, but each company's situation is unique. Each company has unique needs and so on. So, you know, when we look at each company, we try and find out wh what works best for them. It could be direct lending, it could be a different situation. Uh, for direct lending, we're also partner preferred. And what I mean by that is we're not looking to replace or displace the Canadian bank. We're looking to add lending capacity uh, and be a partner with that bank, but maybe to take on some of the, the lending appetite that the, the bank may not have. So for EDC with direct lending, we can do a variety of interesting solutions and structures. We support a variety of industries. It could be food packaging and processing. It could be manufacturing, automotive, aerospace, technology, and so on. Um, but there is a sandbox we play in that most of our deals fit within. In that sandbox, we see companies that have at least three years of operations. Their annual revenues are of at least $10 million. Um, we are providing senior secured loans to them, and usually the loan size is at least $500,000 and up. Um, there also has to be a trade or an export angle, uh, and the company has to be bankable. Now, the types of situations we often support, um, I mean, Scott Barrett is one example where the company is, is moving to a different country, uh, like the U.S., and the bank may not be as comfortable financing those assets, and the export guarantee program might not be the optimal solution. So we can be a lender as the company expands into a market like the U.S., Mexico, Vietnam, Australia, and so on, uh, and be the primary lender. So basically helping a company either set up a foreign subsidiary or grow those foreign operations. Uh, we can also play a role in things such as foreign acquisitions. If a Canadian company is looking to acquire maybe a U.S. competitor, a Mexican competitor, or so on, to help grow their business, again, we can play a role by lending to support that acquisition. Uh, we also get involved when a Canadian company has some large export contracts. Maybe we're financing capital equipment they'll use in Canada to complete those export contracts, uh, or maybe there's other ways we can support that contract through the direct loan or through the export guarantee program that Elaine talked about. Finally, we often get involved just to add bank capacity. For fast-growing companies like Scott Barrett, sometimes, again, the bank is looking for a lending partner. EDC is a non-competitive lending partner that can work with the bank to whether it's a guarantee or a co-loan, uh, we can also be part of the bank syndication for larger clients. So those are types of situations where we could basically support a company like Scott Bear as they have these international growth plans. Uh, now, just backtrack for a second. I mentioned that direct loans are usually from EDC for companies with revenues above 10 million and for deal size above 500,000. And that's because usually we're supporting the bank, there's already a bank in the picture, and we find for those smaller deals, the smaller companies, the direct loan may not be the optimal solution. In a lot of those cases, the export guarantee program is the best solution for lending support. Um, but there are also other types of tools in our toolbox, so to speak, we can use for small and medium-sized companies. I mean, whether it's matchmaking and networking or risk mitigation and insurance tools. And one tool I want to highlight right now is the accounts receivable insurance. Uh, a lot of companies know that as a way to mitigate risks, the non-payment risks, the bankruptcy and solvency risk of your buyer. But I'm highlighting this today because it's also used as a sales tool and a tool to get more working capital quite often. What I mean by that is quite often if a Canadian company is doing a sale to a foreign buyer, they'll want cash in advance. Uh, they're hesitant to provide payment terms to a new buyer in a foreign market. However, with accounts receivable insurance, we've seen a lot of companies are comfortable offering in terms of net 90 days, net 120, net 180, because they know that insurance is in place if things go wrong. So it's a sales tool to better enable them to entice companies to buy from them. Uh, in addition to that, I mentioned the working capital piece. Of course, a bank will lend against the assets a Canadian company has, but of course, banks are also looking to mitigate any downside risk. So sometimes a bank will not provide any lending value to an accounts receivable to a foreign company. Maybe it's a Vietnamese buyer, a Chinese buyer. However, we've seen that with the accounts receivable insurance, the bank will often provide 80% to 90% lending value against that accounts receivable of value. Um, which really provides more working capital to the Canadian company. Uh, another solution EDC has uh, is buyer financing, whether that's direct or indirect. 
directly, again, we'd be the lender financing a foreign buyer of Canadian goods, or indirectly, which is our preference, we'd be partnering with that foreign buyer's local bank uh, to provide some kind of support to that bank to allow them to buy from Canada. And that support is generally for machinery or equipment by a terminal for three to five years, and it's something that we can have a collateral charge over. But, you know, Dominique, I can talk for a long time about the different types of solutions we have. There's, there's plenty, as you know. I don't want to get into all those details there. I just want to reinforce to all the companies listening in today that if you do have these export opportunities, these growth strategies, these growth plans, please don't be shy to call EDC to talk to an account manager to see how we can help out. We don't want you to not take advantage of these opportunities because you don't know what solutions are out there. Thanks, Jeff. That's really a great overview of everything or many things that EDC can offer uh, Canadian companies that are in this kind of growth, export growth uh, uh, stage. Um, you mentioned reaching out to an account manager. Is there any other ways that you would suggest a company can go about speaking with EDC about this solution, financing solution or others that you've already mentioned? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, Dominique. And of course, the account manager, as, as uh, Elaine had mentioned, you had mentioned, uh, our website is very comprehensive, lots of details there, a toll-free phone number, a way to submit questions. Um, but also, much like Scott Baird, you can talk to your bank. Uh, we work with a lot of banks across the country. They're not aware of all the solutions we have, but they hopefully have an account manager they can refer you to, and we can try and find a solution that works best for everyone. Excellent. It's almost time to move on to our Q&A session. But before we do, Dan, if you were to look back over the growth of the last five years, going from, 20 million, uh, from a $20 million company in 2009 to a $120 million company in 2013, what words of wisdom or tips could you offer the companies out there that are, may just be starting out on the same kind of journey as Scott Barrett has been on? Um. <clears throat> Financing always being one of the biggest challenges. Uh, definitely maintaining a strong relationship with your financial institution. Um, doing that by uh, putting lots of effort into your uh, forecasting and developing plans and delivering those plans so that that you, you develop a, a trusting working relationship with your financial institution. Um, is important because when the day comes where you have to stretch uh, your your uh, ratios, for instance, or or find funds for expansion, um, it's much easier to sell that opportunity to your financial institution uh, when you have a track record to go by. So uh, do what you say and say what you're going to do. Um, is important. It's important in, uh, for growth like that to make sure you get the right uh, people around you. Hiring people that have seen this type of growth before is important. Um, I think uh, when the opportunity for you uh, shows itself to expand uh, into the export market, um, my it's gone very well for me, so I would recommend that when the opportunity comes to to be able to actually manufacture in a foreign location um, to, to take advantage of that. There are all kinds of benefits that come from that. There is a lot of regional support in various places, uh, U.S. in particular, where you have states that uh, work very hard to entice you to come to their region. They give you tax incentives and abatements and training grants and, and everything of that nature and it puts you in the heart of a very large market to expand and it's not and and don't view it like you're taking jobs away from Canadians because it's exactly the opposite uh, what it what EDC and our growth and our expansion in the US allowed us to do was grow our business uh, get a, a lot of new customers in a foreign market that we would not otherwise have been able to get had we not been manufacturing in that location. And as it, as the whole uh, business evolves, it's now uh, afforded us the opportunity to also grow our Canadian business, amalgamate our six buildings into one, and, and really uh, raise our, our international status by having uh, large, very qualified facilities and people in both countries. So taking advantage of, of, uh, 
of moving to export and, and manufacturing close to your customer, uh, I would also um, jump at that opportunity uh, if I had it. And uh, jumping at opportunities, last thing I would say is that when you have one, um, be brave, be confident, and because uh, you need to make hay when the sun shines. So uh, capture those opportunities when they come because um, they don't come that often sometimes. Well, it seems that that's exactly what you and your company have done. So that's great. Thanks for taking the time to share your story and share your insight and your tips, very good tips, getting closer to your customer and a bit into your, your strategic vision for the future. Mike, did you have uh, anything to add to, uh, to what Dan has said in conclusion? Yeah, the only thing I would suggest is know your market, understand where you're headed to, and know your risk, uh, not so much from a consumer side, but who's going to chase you. So um, we did a lot of due diligence before we entered into the field of use that we're into today, and uh, thankfully we're a market leader and plan to be there for a long time. So hire well, get people around you who know more than you, and let them do what they do best. And Jeff or Elaine, did you have anything further you wanted to add in terms of maybe a customer is looking for financing or thinking that uh, they're in a similar situation before we go and, and uh, go into the questions that are coming from our audience? I would just kind of reiterate what uh, Jeff mentioned and I mentioned earlier. Don't be afraid to contact us. A lot of people have the impression that uh, we only work with large companies, but as I mentioned, under the Export Guarantee Program, we've issued very tiny guarantees and very large guarantees. So, so contact your local EDC office and, uh, and we'll be there to help you walk through all the various products and the ways that we can support you in your international growth. Excellent. And Jeff? Yeah, I, I would say that we can't solve all problems, but there are so many u unique solutions that EDC can provide to Canadian companies that there's no harm to at least contact us to see what we can do. Even if it's something as simple as us providing matchmaking information for you, market intelligence for certain countries as you're looking into a market like China, Brazil, or so on. So uh, just don't, don't be hesitant to reach out and, and ask those questions. Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, hopefully this has given a lot of food for thought for you and has uh, spurred some questions in your head. And it's actually time to, for us to start our open question period. And we'll try to squeeze in as many questions as possible. So if you'd like to ask a question, please click on the Q&A button on the lower left-hand side of the screen. So let's uh, first see. I will be receiving the questions here on my computer, and then I'll, I'll throw them out to our, our panel, and uh, we can see who is best placed to answer each one of them. So we do have a first question that has come in. Buyer financing was mentioned, but it was. But I was also wondering if EDC finances suppliers. So I can take that one. Dominic. Perfect. Elaine will. Uh, so um, if your supplier uh, needs financing to produce the goods that they're going to be supplying you with and they can go to their bank uh, in, uh, in Canada and get that financing, we can support um, those type of financing opportunities as long as what they're selling to you, you will then incorporate into what you export. Excellent. Anything to add? Yeah, it's uh, Jeff here, Dominique. Uh, I actually saw an example of that last year. So a Canadian company, a customer of ours, um, very, very strong company, had a great relationship with a supplier, but they are both looking for a way for maybe the supplier to offer more terms to the companies that are existing customer. What ended up happening actually is a mixture of two solutions. One was the export guarantee program, working with that supplier's bank to add more lending capacity, but also the accounts receivable insurance. And what happened there with the accounts receivable insurance is it allowed that supplier to get comfortable offering terms to their customer, which in turn was beneficial to our customer because they didn't have to now pay their supplier right away. So it really helped both companies um, really get more access to working capital and work better together. Excellent, great example. The next question, our company has a current debt and at maximum on our credit facility. We have approached EDC who has requested our bank to extend our credit facilities. However, the bank refuses to do so. Any uh, advice for this, uh, this company? 
Well, I think the first thing that I would offer is um, to find out if your bank is aware. Uh, well, obviously, sorry, they are aware that EDC is in the picture. And unfortunately, if the bank is, is truly not comfortable, even with our guarantee support uh, to provide you with the additional financing, unfortunately, there's nothing that we can do under the export guarantee program. Um, I don't know, Jeff, if you have something to add to that, perhaps under the direct lending that might be something we could do, but under the Export Guarantee Program, we have to work with your bank. Um, and so if they're not willing to add that capacity, unfortunately, we can't play a role under that uh, program. Yeah, Elaine, it's Jeff here. Uh, every situation, again, as I mentioned, is unique to that, that customer. It's case by case. Um, in some cases, maybe EDC doing a direct loan may work. Uh, but again, there's different tools in our toolbox, as I keep saying. It could be the accounts receivable insurance, which just increases the amount of margin available under the operating line. It could be a way we can partner with the bank to get the, the bank more comfortable issuing letters of credit, letters of guarantee, which can then be used in creative ways to structure export contracts. Um, so I'd say, really, there's different solutions we could look at. Um, but to your point, Elaine, if, if the bank's not comfortable with the export guarantee program, uh, it's hard for us to, to, to force their hand. We're, we're partners with the bank and with the exporter. Everyone has to agree on the right approach. Excellent. Thank you. The next question is uh, wondering if we can use a letter of credit, an LC, from an international customer as colla collateral for a loan. Have you ever it's, seen this? Uh, Jeff. Yeah? Yeah, it's Jeff here. We would be looking to use that as, as collateral. Uh, for our loan. Usually when EDC is direct lending, uh, we are looking at tangible assets such as machinery and equipment. Uh, in the Scott Barrett example, kind of the machinery and equipment we finance for them would form our tangible collateral. That being said, I guess, Elaine, under the Export Guarantee Program, if there's a variety of collateral to a loan facility, uh, we would follow the bank's lead, assuming it made commercial sense. Is that correct? That's correct, Jeff. Excellent. The next question is pertaining to accounts receivable insurance, although this, you know, we don't necessarily have the experts of accounts receivable insurance here. Maybe what they're asking is more about, you know, general rates, what is the general pricing for accounts receivable insurance? And I think that that may be a very difficult question to answer because pricing is always tailored to the specific transaction and the specific uh, risks. But uh, does, Jeff, do you, would you have any insight to provide on, on that? Yeah, of course. Uh, so again, pricing, as you say, Dominique, is very specific to each scenario, and it'll depend on the, the credit strength of the the buyer we're insuring, and also depend on the, the the overall volume of the policy and how many buyers are in there, how diversified that risk is. Uh, you know, for for top tier buyers, I'm thinking like you know the WalMarts and the Apples of the world, it's a pretty low premium, maybe 0.1 uh, percent. But if you're looking at maybe a higher risk buyer in a challenging market like Greece or Egypt. It's not uncommon for that insurance to be as high as maybe 1.5 percent. It's a really big range, so it's going to really depend on uh, that the buyer you're looking at, the country of risk, and how many buyers you're putting in your portfolio of the insurance. Because we could insure just one buyer or your whole portfolio of in, uh, receivables. I think it's fair to say also that you know a quick inquiry in, through uh, EDC's website or a quick conversation with one of our uh, people that are on our 1-800 number can give you better insight into the specifics of your transaction, of your, your, uh, your portfolio, and the pricing that might be tied to that. The next question, can EDC help a company get working capital for their foreign subsidiary? So I'll take that, uh, Dominic. So there's a couple of ways that uh, we can help here. Um, when you as the parent fund uh, your foreign affiliate, we can guarantee a loan from your bank for that purpose. Or there may be a situation where your foreign affiliate uh, wants to set up their own operating line with a local foreign bank. And in a case like that, typically the foreign bank will look for a standby letter of credit from the Canadian Parents Bank in Canada. So they would issue that uh, standby letter of credit as security for the operating line offshore for your foreign affiliate. And we can provide a guarantee to that bank uh, for the full amount of that uh, standby LC. And in this way, your bank won't tie up uh, your cash to support that standby letter of credit or won't freeze, uh, free, uh, sorry, freeze funds in your operating line of credit with our guarantee there to support that. Excellent. Thank you. Going back on the, the 
question of price. Uh, we have another question that came in related to the cost of uh, how much does it cost to get financing from EDC. And again, I would imagine that the answer is, is very, it varies significantly, but if you could provide insight into the factors that may weigh into the pricing decisions on financing. So if we're talking about the export guarantee program, um, we have what we call grid pricing and that pricing relates to um, your risk rating, so how the bank uh, rates your company from a risk perspective. And so our rates are very much associated with your risk rating. Um, I don't know, Jeff, if you have anything to add on to that for direct lending, but it's, uh, it does basically work with regard to uh, risk rating and what collateral supports the loan. Mm, of course. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it, Elaine. For direct lending as well, uh, the big criteria are going to be the risk rating of the company, the nature and location of the assets. Uh, other factors will come into play as well, such as the loan to value we're providing. Um, you know, higher loan to value may, may dictate a higher pricing. Uh, and we price to market and price to risk when we direct lend. So we're not looking to undercut uh, the, the existing bank market. So, for example, if we are uh, financing your US, as, your U.S. assets, we would probably price that loan a bit higher than you're getting for your, your Canadian assets, just to factor in that risk premium. In terms of EGP, so I guess more directed to you, Elaine, yeah. how is it if a supplier deals with more risky countries? So I imagine generally, you know, here they mentioned the Middle East, but any area where there is more political strife, can does that pose any restrictions in, in your ability to extend support? Um, with rega regard to our program or any of our financing programs, um, we can't support transactions that um, are related to countries that Canada has sanctions against. Um, and so the bank would be under the same restrictions as well. Um, but under the Export Guarantee Program, the bank is always our partner, the Canadian Bank, and the financing relates to um, financing for you or your foreign affiliate. So we're basically taking the risk of the company in Canada uh, when we're looking at that. And, and if, for instance, the support related to a contract to a company, um, to a buyer in a high-risk market, we would take that into account, but what would be the, the final determinant is whether there is uh, sanctions against that country, because mm -hmm. that's something that we could not support. And is there any kind of online tools or information for customers to go see whether there are some hot spots that we can't cover in? Mm -hmm. Is anybody aware of, of that? Um, I can answer one part of that question and, and that is uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs has an updated list of all the countries Canada has sanctions against so that's a, a really good uh, starting point and we have a lot of economic information on various countries around the world on our, on our website as well. Excellent. Um, so a lot of questions around the, the different high risk markets and I think that also in, on in terms of EDC and what we can offer there is a lot of information on our website about country risk and so suggest going to even EDC's website and finding more about how EDC views certain countries in terms of the risk profile and, and still talking to EDC. EDC is, is still a company or a crown corporation that is seeking to support our Canadian companies so even when the markets are a bit more risky uh, there may be a role for EDC to play there. Um, <clears throat> Dan mentioned that it was actually um, their bank that referred uh, them to EDC. What if the bank is not necessarily aware of what EDC can do so the, uh, the Canadian company is talking about it with the bank but the bank is not aware. Is there any information available that the companies can share with their banks? to bring them aware of the products that we can offer? Well, I'm very happy that you uh, asked me that question because uh, recently, about a year and a half ago, we set up a uh, Canadian um, banker's guide on edc.ca. It's on our landing page. It's uh, towards the bottom left-hand corner of the page. And uh, it has information about all the solutions that we work with with Canadian banks. Um, and uh, it certainly has a wealth of information on the, uh, the Export Guarantee Program and other other programs that that we offer. So the address for that is http colon uh, two slashes fi guide all lowercase dot edc dot ca 
slash EN or FR. Uh, and they would go in and click on the tab called Learn About Our Products. And all of the information is there. It's tailored to banks. Uh, the application form is there, sample guarantees if they want to see what they look like, um, and that, that type of thing. So that's a really good place to uh, direct your bankers to if they're not aware of uh, the program. Excellent. Another question we received, can EDC finance small buyers in other countries without collateral? Maybe Jeff, over to you on that one. Yeah, sure. It's, it's, to be honest, it's sometimes challenging for us to finance uh, small buyers in foreign markets and there's no collateral. If we can find a way to partner with that uh, buyer's bank, maybe there's a solution we can come about. Uh, but by and large, when we're doing something where we're lending directly, we need to have some kind of tangible collateral. Uh, but of course, open to seeing what we can do to partner with that foreign bank if need be. So I haven't received any further questions here. If you do have a question, please do press the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and send it in the next minute or so. Um, does anybody else have anything to add to this conversation? Terms? Um, maybe I'll just add that um, with regard to your bank's understanding the export guarantee program um, and other programs that we have, our local sales force meets with their counterparts at all of the big banks that, that we work with and we also work with some smaller banks as well. And uh, on our team, our, our um, what we call our region leads, uh, we go out and we meet with the head offices of the banks and the credit groups of the banks and we're always trying to get our message out there so that there's we de demystify what we do with the banks and we find that's a really good way to sort of keep us top of mind and um, and it really uh, invites a relationship with the individuals that we're talking to so they're comfortable picking up the phone and asking us about a certain scenario that comes to them from their customers who are exporters and and so it it really lends itself well to getting that information out there and to opening up the lines of communication. Excellent, thanks. We did get um one more question, which is maybe just seeking some clarity on something that's already been said, uh, seeking for you to elaborate a bit more on what you meant by risk grading. So, okay, I, in, in describing how you price, I think you were talking about the risk yeah. grading. So, um, whenever a financial institution is looking to provide financing to a company, uh, we're going to look at your financial statements. So, typically, we'll look at your last three years' financial statements, and we'll look at your cash flow projections going forward. And taking into account all of those aspects, we'll come up with a risk rating for the company. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of Moody's or Standard & Poor risk rating. We have a certain um, um, tool that we use that we put the information into, we analyze the information and that will provide us with a risk rating. However, we'll do our own analysis um, on your company when the bank comes to us for a guarantee, but also we'll look at how the bank has rated your company because they know you a lot better than we do. They come and they meet with you every year, they go through your, your plant with you, they have conversations with you, so they're much closer to you because you truly are their customer. And so we also also rely quite a lot on how the bank has rated the company. So I hope that uh, helps to answer that question. Excellent. So I think we'll, um, we'll stop it at that. We haven't received any further questions, but it's not the end. If you have further questions, you can still send them in and we will do our best to uh, look at them and send you back a response. Um, by email, you can send it to us and uh, we will get back to you. I'd also like to remind participants that they'll be able to review today's presentation on our website. So you'll, re you'll be receiving an email from EDC with a link to access it so that you can refer back to it or share it with others. If you'd like to learn more about EDC's various financial solutions, just go to our website, as we've mentioned before, at edc.ca uh, slash solutions. You'll find a ton of information and resources right there. Thank you very much for joining us and thank you for our special guests Dan and Mike uh, as well as Jeff and Elaine for offering all of the great story that you shared about Scott Barrett as well as the expertise on the financing solutions at EDC.